Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. I uh, wanted to do a quick study that was put on my heart. There's a lot of verses I could have gone over, but we're going to go over some verses. And I encourage you, brothers and sisters in Christ, to continue the study, to do the word study, to do the subject study on your own. I'm a King James Bible believer. I have my notes where I have things underlined and highlighted. And I read from the notes and I have the Bible to show that this is where I'm getting my notes. It's from the King James Bible. Okay. And today we're going to talk about trusting your heart. Okay, you hear that all the time in the lost world. You hear it in the Hollywood movies, TV shows, even some video games. Um, uh, when they uh, try to tell you, like sell you something, they try to get you to trust your heart so they can sell it to you and deceive you. Kind of getting ahead of myself, but you know, um, my brain sometimes doesn't want to get the right words out. Advertisement, that's the word I was looking for. An advertisement and political, you know, vote for this person, vote for that person. Trust your heart, trust your heart. Okay, what does the Bible say? But before we get to the trust your heart part, the whole point I'm doing this again is it's, it's almost like a plea again to the brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ out there that still have, you know, conviction in their heart, the Holy Spirit in you that's saying something's not right with how I'm living my life, whether it be video games, movies, uh, Hollywood movies, TV shows, uh, secular style music, satanic style music, um, getting drunk, you know, being an alcoholic, being a drug addict, you know, all these fleshly sins. And people today, um, they, they just... I'll quote a few verses that we've already quoted in the past. I'm um, trying not to, you know, beat a what they call beating a dead horse. Those who will listen will listen, but I want to read a few. But God put a new thing on my heart that we really don't talk about when it comes to these things. And I wanted to share it with the brethren. But first, I, we talk about this all the time. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 5.22. Okay? We say this, and this in itself, 1 Thessalonians 5.22 and Psalms 101.3 should be more than enough to get people to give up their video games. Hollywood movies, TV shows, anime cartoons, okay, the anime cartoons, and secular style music, the alcohol, the weed, the cigarettes, on and on and on, whatever other sin you're doing. To give that up, this should be enough. Okay. So I want to read them again one more time. 1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from all appearance of evil. And we've said this, brethren, I've seen comments, I've talked to brethren, fellowship, and they say it all the time, abstain from all appearance of evil to people. And they don't like that verse. They just don't like it. Okay? So we've preached that to them before. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Not some, not what you deem evil, what the Word of God deems evil. And we throw it at them, and they'll just come back and try to attack us personally. Or they'll try to ignore those verses, and then they'll try to grab other verses. You know, the verses about liberty, and they'll misuse liberty. Okay, you don't have liberty to sin, but they don't like to hear that. So then you turn to Psalms 101.3. Turn to Psalms 101.3. We read this one to them. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Well, we'll stop there, but I want to keep reading, but we're going to stop there. We always say that. When, you're just, when we're trying to do it from memory, we always say, put no wicked thing before thine eyes. I've said it. But I've never kept going. So... This right here, I'm preaching to saved sinners, not the lost. I'm preaching to you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? Let's keep going. It says, I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Now, you're not to hate the person. Absolutely, you preach the gospel to the lost world. You encourage and preach the word of God to save people. Okay? But the thing there says, I hate the work of them that turn aside. This whole big thing that's been exploding among Bible-believing brethren, Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, the, the enemy, Satan, and his servants are trying to get you to think that it's this man versus this man. You have to be on this his side, or you got to be on this guy's side. Uh, that's deception. They try, to, they try to make you think that we Bible believers, Bible believing, God fearing men that are in ministry are attacking people that are struggling with sin. That's not true. Don't let them deceive you, brothers and sisters in Christ, and not seeing the real picture. The real picture is this carnally minded and walking after the flesh, 
versus spiritually minded and walking after the spirit. Choosing the world, the ways of the world, the flesh, sin, over the word of God. Those are the two sides. People who justify sin, not struggling. I will not attack somebody who is saying, I am struggling with this sin. It is sin. It is wrong. I'm not supposed to do it. I keep falling back into it every so often. Pray for me and I give them advice. I don't just say, okay, I'll pray for you. I give them advice on ways to help keep that temptation at bay. Not falling into sin, choosing to sin, but keep that temptation at bay. What's going on here is you have people justifying sin versus those of us who are saying, we're not justifying the sin. We've had those problems. I've talked and listened to so many testimonies of people that had problems, saved sinners struggling with sin. The key is they're fighting it. There's a war with the flesh versus someone who's on the same side as the flesh. I justify my sin. There's nothing wrong with it. And the Bible clearly teaches, I did a study way back when, about is there justification to break fellowship? And the Bible teaches there is. Listen to this. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. If you're fellowshipping with somebody who's justifying sin, not struggling with sin, justifying sin, it's going to cleave to you. Next thing you know, you're going to fall into those sins. How do I know this? I've talked to brethren that have testified that they were fellowshipping with groups of people that were just totally indulging the flesh. And then they started indulging the flesh. They started giving in and falling into temptation. They started watching anime movies, uh, cartoons, movies, TV shows, video games, started getting back into drinking a little bit, smoking a cigarette here and there. After God got them clean of it for years, they fell back into it. Why? Not because they were tempted by the world. Not because they were tempted by their flesh. It was because a professing brother or sister in Christ put a stumbling block in front of them. They tempted him. That's dangerous. That's why the Bible is clear. I, I can go into a big off study, and I already have, about carnally minded, about, you know, are you supposed to fellowship? There's justification to break fellowship. What is it? When people are in sin, and they love their sin, and they don't want to give it up, they could be a saved brother or sister in Christ. If they're in sin, you break fellowship with them until they get their heart right with the Lord. And when they get their heart right with the Lord, cleaning up their life and getting that sin out, you can welcome back into your fellowship. It says, I hate the work of them that turn aside, it shall not cleave to me. Do you hate the work of sin, the work of evil, wickedness? Oh yeah, 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 I hate it. Then why are so many people compromising and making justifications for still fellowshipping with people that are justifying sin? Their heart's not right with the Lord. I'm being nice and saying, hey, they might be saved. They're saved. Their heart's not right with the Lord. Okay. So we preach these verses to them, and these you got people that still love their sin. Okay. When you quit alcohol, let's say you're an alcoholic, you quit alcohol, you can't have anything to do with alcohol. Can you have a glass of wine according to the Bible? Absolutely. For med medicinal purposes. Absolutely. Right? And there was another mention, I can't remember the verse, so there's another mention for a reason for drinking a glass of wine. Not getting drunk, but drinking a glass of wine. But when you have someone who's a drunkard, they've got to get it out of their life completely. I have family members, I'm using this as an example, if you have family members that still like to drink and get drunk and everything, you can't hang out with them. You have to break off everything with them to get your heart right with the Lord. He that loveth mother or father more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I've, you have heard people try to use parents and children as an excuse for sin. Not worthy of Jesus Christ. You're to love Jesus Christ more. And if that means you have to forsake people that are tempting you and trying to get you in, in, in to sin, then you've got to do it. All right. Why? Because that sin will cleave to you. You'll start doing it. You'll start promoting it. You will start putting uh, stumbling blocks. Someone put a stumbling block in your way. Guess what? You're turning around and doing it the same thing and putting a stumbling block in other brethren's way. All right. This is a this is like a plea, last minute plea again, 
to those that are still struggling with those things. Uh, struggling is a good thing. Get those things out of your life. Okay, you cannot truly glorify God. And this gets to the next part. I always preach those verses about glorifying God. You gave God glory in all things because he that is in the flesh cannot please God. You got to glorify God in everything you do. And if it's just pleasing the flesh, then you're not pleasing God. You can't please the God and your flesh at the same time. Okay? It doesn't work. Okay? You should give God thanks in all things. Okay? Uh, Colossians 3.17. There's another verse that I talk about when I'm pleading with the brethren. If you're lost, you need to get saved. You don't clean up your life and then get saved. You need to get saved. You need to come to God broken having sorrow for your personal sins that you've sinned against God. And the consequences of that sin is you're going to go to hell to burn forever because you've sinned against God. That's your destination. But it doesn't have to be your final destination. There's a way out. Repentance towards God. Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. The blood that was shed on the cross is God's blood. Not lowercase g, God. Capital G, God. The Father's blood was shed on Calvary, Jesus is God fully and completely, and He paid the price that you are supposed to pay for your sins. Now you owe Jesus Christ. What do you do? You go to Him and you confess your repentance and your belief. You talk to Him. We, the Bible calls it prayer. When you talk to the Lord, that's what the Bible calls prayer. You go to Him and you confess those things. And then you ask God to save you. For those of us who are saved, you need to get your heart right with the Lord. You need to get that stuff out. Colossians 3.17 And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father, God and the Father by Him. Word or deed. We've talked about this. I just wanted to go over these verses real quick. Okay. Uh, there's no argument there. And word and deed. Basically, your whole life is supposed to go from being 100% about the flesh, the ways of the world, sin, to being 100% about Jesus Christ. You go from being carnally minded, in Romans chapter 8, I think it is, going from being carnally minded to being spiritually minded. Carnally minded, walking after the flesh. The flesh is in charge. You're in unison. You're on the same side. There's no war to now you're spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit. There's a war against the flesh. The flesh gets put down. You're not in charge anymore. God is. I'm not in charge anymore. Lord, you're in charge. Why are people not acting like it that profess to be Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women? It's a wake-up call. Right? But we hear the statement, trust your heart, trust your heart, and I'm seeing a lot of feelings and opinions, and a lot of the attacks that I get are mostly feelings and opinions. Sometimes people will quote scripture, and we'll get into the scriptures, and I might miss a scripture, and I could be wrong in this area. But oftentimes, it's they're misquoting scripture, like taking it out of context. Um, I'll tell a story real quick before we get into it. Uh, I was downtown with my truck, and someone saw the sticker on my truck. And I rolled down my window because they come up to the window and said, thank you for that sticker. It's, um, uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh yeah, the world needs that. And then he looked at me and goes, so where do you worship? Oh, not worship, sorry. Where do you go to church? And I say, and I looked at him and said, I'm already in church 24-7. I'm part of the body of Christ. And he stops and looks at me and goes, I mean, where do you worship? Oh, I worship at home. And it confused him. And I said, are, are you talking about a, one of these buildings that you build and call a church? I said, that's anti-scripture. The scripture's against me, against it. I said, I looked at him and said, show me in scripture, where in scripture, that it says that we're to build a building and call that building a church and call that building, because they'll attack you. we would be saying we can't build a building. And call the building a church and treat the building as a church and a temple. And they do that. And then invite lost people to it. There's the big one. Invite lost people to it. I said, show me where at. And guess what verse he quoted? He turned to Hebrews. Not forsaking the fellowship of... Uh, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And I looked at him and went, Who's the book of Hebrews written to? And before I could get the sentence out, the question out, he cut me off and said, Christians. 
I said, no, it's written to Hebrews. No, Christians. And he cut me off again. Christians. People are going to they're going to twist the Bible so they can live how they want. He loves his social club, his flesh services. He loves his flesh. Okay, that's what it comes down to. I said it's for the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. Nope, Christians. And he's walking away as he's saying it, Christians, Christians, and ignoring anything else I have to say. It's like he doesn't believe in God's word, but people will quote verses sometimes, brethren, and they'll be twisting it and misusing it. But oftentimes, most, I'd have to say, 80% to 90% of the comments I get that attack me, that attack the ministry, that ultimately they're attacking this book, the book I hold dear, that they claim to hold dear. It's all feelings and opinions. It's their heart. I'm going with my heart. All right. Turn to Mark chapter 7, verse 20. That and their PWCs, probably want a cracker. They're parroting what someone else told them because they're part of their club. And in order to be part of their club, they've got to sprout the same junk that they're sprouting. And I'm getting that a lot with some of the people that are supposed to be brethren in the body of Christ. They're just sprouting the same junk that somebody else that's standing up there saying, I'm just going to, you know, I justify sin, you know. And they just PWCs because they love their sin. So they join this group that's okay with sin and on and on and on. But Mark 7.20 this is Jesus speaking. And he said, this is after the Pharisees were attacking um, the disciples for not washing their hands before they ate. Mark 7.20 And he said, That which cometh out of a man, that defileth the man. For within out of the heart of men, the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts. Notice it separates that from adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. It separates them from all of that. You can still have evil thoughts. Uh -huh. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. But you're supposed to trust the heart. They always tell you, trust your heart. This person, they get they get on a video and they they put on a good show and everything, and, and they've got to be saved. Trust your heart. Trust your feelings. I feel like they're saved, and I feel like what they're telling me is truth. But why aren't you picking this up saying, God, you show me what the truth is. But they go after the heart. What does your heart do? Your heart's going to deceive you every time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Turn to Jeremiah 17.9. A lot of people don't like this one. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God does. His word does. Sharper and powerful than any two-edged sword. Piercing asunder uh, and knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. God knows. And he shows us. How are you going to see somebody for who they really are? You compare them to this. Do they line up with scripture or do they line up with the world? Well, you know, but he's, he's a brother in Christ and she's a sister in Christ. Do they line up with the world or do they line up with the Bible and how they live their life? For a while there, they can use good words and fair speeches and say the right things for a while. But does their life line up with their words? Remember what we just read back there in Colossians 3.17. In word and deed, they need to line up. And it's got to be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They have to line up. But what do people do? They try to tell you to trust your heart. Your heart's deceitful. In other words, it'll deceive you. And you're going to trust your heart? Go with your feelings and opinions? Now we're going to transition a little bit because it's going to talk about the heart, the imagination of the heart. Trust your heart. One of the big things that's not being talked about right now when it comes to all this sin and this junk, which is sin, I don't want it in my life, is the whole concept of the Bible telling you that man's imagination is always going to steer him wrong. It's wicked. Okay. Turn to Genesis 6.5. Turn to Genesis 6.5. And God saw that the wickedness, here is it. hopefully that's not too loud. It doesn't sound too loud to me, but the mic could easily pick it up. 
If I have to redo this, we'll redo it. Genesis 6, 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's how bad the world got before the flood. The Bible says it's going to get that way again, and it is. You look at this world, I was talking with some of the brethren, you look at this world, almost nothing lines up to the Bible anymore. Everything that God says, this is how it's supposed to be, this is how things are supposed to be done, you're supposed to be living this way, you're supposed to be doing these things this way, you're not supposed to be doing it. It's perverted everything. What did we just read there? The imagination of, thought, imaginations, imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's today, brothers and sisters in Christ. We're seeing that a lot today. But you're being told to go with feelings and opinions, and they're using good words and fair speeches because they'll claim to be Bible believers, and they sit there and go, but it's all about, they just give their feelings and opinions, and they appeal to your flesh. I'll go back to what I said, brothers and sisters in Christ. Satan has two goals for mankind. Okay? You read throughout the Bible, two goals. He wants to prevent people from getting saved. They want as many people to go to hell like he's going to. The lake of fire to burn for all eternity. He's going to try everything he can, putting roadblock after roadblock after roadblock to try to prevent people from getting saved. And God's putting up roadblock after roadblock after roadblock to push people in the right direction so they can get saved. But Satan's one goal is to prevent people from getting saved. What's his number two goal? Those who do get saved, he wants to mess you up. He wants you to lose rewards. He wants to see God punish you. Chastisement. Okay. That's the two goals of Satan when you read this book. All our warnings about Satan is he's going to come in and he's going to mess you up as a Christian. He's going to ruin your walk with the Lord. Your relationship with the Lord. That's his goal. Okay. That's why the Bible teaches us that from such withdraw thyself. When they're teaching wrong, when they're living wrong, uh, a brother in Christ has wronged the brethren because he's in sin, he's justifying that sin, he's promoting that sin, he's putting stumbling blocks in front of the brother. The Bible teaches that you go to him by yourself to correct him. If he won't hear you, you take two or three witnesses with you. If you won't hear him, you take the whole church saying, okay, let's try to edify this, get this brother back on the right track. If you won't hear you, he's to be as a heathen and a publican. You treat him like he's lost. I can't fellowship with you. You're out. Don't come back till you get your heart right with the Lord. There's a reason for that. Okay? You let that in. Your heart, they're going to try to keep pushing you to do your heart. Just go off your heart. They'll try to say, I'm a Bible believer. But in the end, when you're actually setting down, those of us, the Holy Spirit in us, and we're trained, we've been taught, compare Scripture with Scripture, and look at them and compare them to this. Do they line up with this? Well, they're using a lot of feelings and opinions. They're trying to appeal to your heart. They try to appeal to your flesh. Okay. Genesis 8.21. Go ahead and turn to Genesis 8.21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. Why are we talking about this? What do you think video games are? They're the imagination of man's heart. Movies. Most movies. Like I said, there's some documentaries I have about, you can call it a movie where it's about the Bible version issue or uh, true life stories of people's lives. But I'm talking about Hollywood movies and TV shows, anime, you know, all that junk. What is it? It's the imagination of man's heart. And it's always going to pull you away from the Lord. Every time. Okay. We'll get on the meditation, where your meditation is supposed to be on the heart. But I still want to keep hammering the, what man's heart's imagination is. Turn to Proverbs chapter 6, 16. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are abomination unto him. Stop there for a second. People don't get that. When you're doing all, when you see someone doing all seven of these, 
together they're an abomination but there's six things that the Lord hates okay when you're doing all seven you're an abomination yea seven are an abomination to him verse 8 a proud look have we seen this with people who are defending their sin lately in the body of Christ have I fallen into having a haughty spirit trying to defend some of my mistakes I've always got to keep every day talking to the Lord okay am I getting a haughty spirit am I making mistakes and trying to make excuses for him okay. proud look a lying tongue are we seeing that today among the body of Christ absolutely not some I believe are saved but I think there's a lot of false converts that slithered their way in with good words and fair speeches and now their true life is coming to light and how they're living their life it doesn't line up with scripture it lines up with the world and what do they come back with a lying tongue they have a proud look lying tongue hands that are sh hands that shed innocent blood okay. hopefully no one's doing that but there are people out there doing that verse 18 a heart that deviseth wicked imagination feet that be swift to run to mischief as there have been people that are supposed to be professing Bible believing God fearing men that have been causing mischief and women that have been causing mischief in the body of Christ lately absolutely 19 a false witness that speaketh lies and he that soweth discord among the brethren we see all that happening today okay? Except for, like I said, the hands that shed innocent blood. But verse 18, it says, A heart that devises wicked imagination. God hates that. Every day I'm take, talking to the Lord saying, I have to cut myself off sometimes because I'm talking to the Lord. We start, I start thinking about one thing, and that one thing leads to me thinking about a movie, or a TV show, or a video game, or I start daydreaming about stuff, and it doesn't glorify God. And I have to stop myself and say, Vain imagination. Lord, please forgive me. I'm getting that out. Let's get focused. What were we talking about? Okay, we're talking about this. And then start talking with the Lord again. Vain imagination. I have to keep reminding myself. Get it out of your head. Why? Because vain imagination, the, the imagination of the heart, is going to lead to wickedness. Okay? And God hates that. The, the heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. The people out there that are taking that imagination, and not, not brothers and sisters in Christ that are kicking it out, but people that are making these Hollywood movies, these video games, the TV shows, the anime, they're putting out this stuff, they're taking this imagination. We're supposed to have great imagination, and they're creating all this wickedness and this filth that's anti-God. It goes against Scripture. It goes against the ways of the Lord. That's the way the whole world is today. He hates people who devise that and do that and push other people towards that. Okay. You think God's okay with people standing for video games and movies and TV shows and secular, satanic style music? He hates it because you're trying to push other people to it. Okay. Turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination and their foolish heart was darkened now you can keep reading keep reading but notice it says they became vain in their imagination that's why I say that brethren vain imagination vain imagination when you go off the heart it'll steal you astray and take you away from the Lord and imagination is vain vain, vain imagination I haven't mentioned this before that much I haven't seen some of the brethren haven't really touched on this that much Another reason that you shouldn't be playing video games, watching the movies, they could be a clean movie or something, but if it's a made-up story, there's going to be something in it that's not right. Because the heart is always going to try to lead people, even if it's just little by little, away from the Lord. Because they want be they want you, brothers and sisters of Christ, back the way you were before. Your flesh wants you back the way you were, where you were best buddies, and you were feeding it, and you were just having this good old time. That's what your flesh wants. Mm -hmm. That's what the heart, as far as the imagination is the heart, that's what it's going to lead you to. And that's what Satan tries to appeal to. He tries to appeal to your heart. Now, meditations of the heart. I'm going to get ahead of myself. I'll go ahead and read this one. He tries to appeal to your heart. But what happens if you hide God's word in your heart? 
and he tries to appeal to your heart. He's going to be clashing with this right here, and this will, this will tell him, nope, get out. Why? Because you're hiding God's word in your heart. Psalms 119.11 Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. You hide God's word in your heart, not vain imaginations, not video games, not movies, TV shows, secular uh, satanic style music, anything that feeds the flesh, getting drunk, getting high, fornicating, whatever. You hide God's word in your heart, and so when the world comes to tempt you, or your flesh tries to tempt you, this is there saying, no, I'm not doing it. God's word says, no, I'm not to do that. But they're trying to take this and go like this and go, yeah, you know, addiction is bad, but it's not bad in itself, you know. If you're addicted to it, it's bad. And they're trying to take this away from you. Supposed to hide God's word in your heart. Vain imaginations. Turn to Psalms 1914. Psalms 1914. The meditation of the heart. What's your heart supposed to be meditating on? Is it supposed to have supposed to be meditating on imagination? Vain imagination that you get through all these books that you read, like these novels and and movies and TV. Is that where your heart's supposed to be meditating? On vain imaginations. Psalm 1914, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You know one of the things you're supposed to be meditating on every day is, is my life right with the Lord? Lord, is there anything else I need to give up? Is there things I'm supposed to be doing that I'm not supposed to be doing? I want to be pleasing, I want to be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, and my strength and my redeemer. One of the biggest meditations in these last days with all the temptation and the big mess out there in the world is, Lord, is my home a Bible-believing, God-fearing home? Is there anything that I'm doing wrong, Lord? Am I saying something wrong? If I'm, becoming, if I'm getting a haunty spirit, okay? am I starting to lose my temper too, too easily? There's a justification to be angry, but is it happening too often? You go on and on and on. That's what you're supposed to be meditating on. Not how many headshots I got in this first person shooter game. Not, oh, I, I'm going to get drunk tonight, so I got to find up a good way. So I got to get in a fight with my, my husband or my wife. Or I got to, you know, pretend that this sorrow is happening and, and whatever. And you're meditating on things that it's not the Word of God, that's not pleasing to God. And the next thing you know, you come up with some excuse to get drunk, or to get high, or smoke cigarettes, fornicate, whatever. Anything that goes against scripture, the God, you start listening to your heart, and you start doing vain imaginations, and you come up with excuses. Okay? One of the things you're supposed to meditate on is, Lord, what can I do to please you? Not my flesh. What can I do to be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord? Are you doing that, brothers and sisters in Christ? Every day. To me, some days it seems like I'm doing it every second of the day. I'm, I'm having to say vain imagination some days a lot because my mind really wanders. I really burnt out my brain on movies, TV shows, and video games. And I've watched them so many times, it's like they're etched in there. But God has blessed me. The more I spend on this, the less I'm spending on that as far as the thoughts in the head. They usually don't come. Every once in a while, I'll get thrown a curveball. I'll, I'll mention one thing with the Lord, and it reminds me of a movie, and sometimes I'll start going off on the movie, and I have to rein myself back in and say, vain imaginations. Lord, I want to please you. My, my heart's desire is to please you. Brother and sister Christ, you got saved, and you gave your life. You got saved by Jesus Christ, and you gave your life to him when you got saved. It's about pleasing him. And we get frustrated, I know some of the brethren out there, and, and sisters in Christ, brothers and sisters, we get frustrated because you have all these professing Christians that just can't seem to get that. It's about pleasing God. It's about being acceptable in His sight. It's all about Jesus Christ. And they'll claim, oh yeah, I love Jesus Christ. And we get so frustrated because you look at the life they're living, some of the stands they're taking, and it's like, it's not about Jesus Christ for you. It's about the flesh. It's about the world. Turn to Psalms 
119.48, My hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in thy statues. The number one thing you're supposed to be meditating on is right here in my hand, and I pray, pray it's in your hands. King James Bible, God's perfect written word for English-speaking people. Right? That's what you're supposed to be meditating on. That's why I bought the Bible warns us, because I jumped ahead. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. You can heed God's word, because you hid it here. People have it up here, and they're falling into sin and all kinds of wickedness. Why? Because they have head knowledge. But they're not putting it here. They're not heeding it and living it. Evidence that God's word is in someone's heart is that they're living a the life of Christ. We read that acceptable in the sight of God. Now, like I said before, they'll try to say that we attack people who struggle with sin. That's false. We all struggle with sin. I struggle with sin. Am I still acceptable in the sight of God? If I'm in the presence of doing that sin, I'm not. And I need to repent and get that sin out of my life. But the struggles, the temptations, starting to have to sing as him all the time, having to say vain imaginations all the time, having to do Bible studies all the time. There's times when I was first saved, newly saved, I spent so much time in this book because that's what kept me away from the sin. I was doing three or four hour Bible studies. I was listening to Alexander Scorvey a lot because it kept me away from sin. Now I do my Bible studies because God's helping me do some more Bible studies and stuff for the Lord. Yeah. Okay. It's this. This is what you're supposed to be meditating on night and day. You're not supposed to be falling into the trap of vain imagination. And that's what those video games and those movies and those TV shows, no matter how innocent they try to make them out to be, even though we understand that some of those people that are defending this stuff, they're playing obviously wicked games, period. And they're hiding that. But even when you think you found something that's innocent, it doesn't, that's what I kept trying to push back in some of my older videos about it doesn't glorify God. You can't give Him thanks in it. You cannot give God thanks for vain imaginations of the heart. The imagination of mankind. Okay. A good example is, is I tried to correct someone saying you got to be careful about using uh, talking animals and stuff like that because it starts to promote I'm talking about in the world it starts to promote evolution and he goes back to the Bible and grabs um, where the donkey was talking it's a female donkey talking with a man's voice so somebody else is speaking through the donkey the donkey itself wasn't the one speaking when it said the donkey spoke it was saying that that voice was coming from the donkey as far as the man's voice came out of the donkey's mouth you know, the sound was coming from the donkey, but the voice itself was not coming from the donkey itself. But you take that, and man's imagination, vain imagination, they take that, and they try to use that. Well, then I can do poems about animals that talk. Next, I'm doing, you know, poems and cartoons with animals that are wearing clothing. Now they're walking upright. Now they're, they're speaking English. And what does that do? That pushes kids towards evolution. But you'll have people that will defend, well, there's no big deal. It always starts somewhere, small, subtle. It's not a big deal. Having poems, poems about animals that talk and wear a jacket. I think it was like Peter Cottontail or whatever it was. Oh, there's nothing wrong with that. That's the imagination of men. Now look at the world and how wicked it is. Aliens. What do you think most of the aliens, when you used to look at aliens, and they tried to do it in movies and TV shows and video games and even still today they're actually taking par body parts from animal, all these different animals and mixing them up and putting them together and putting them on a man that's evolution and that's what aliens promote evolution what's going on they've gotten away from the Word of God there's nothing wrong with reading that story how God spoke through a donkey had a man's voice speaking through a donkey but when you take that and start doing your own imagination and get away from the Word of God, where does it lead you? Look at what the world's done with it. You'll be shocked at how much of the world you look at it and go, wait a minute, that's kind of like what's in the Bible, only it's so perverted now. It's, you really got to know your Bible to be able to say, 
that kind of like the Bible, but it's so perverted. But in the past, you could be able to say, hey, they got that from the Bible. They copied it. And then they're taking it and twisting it and using it for the world, the way of the world. Today it's getting harder and harder to tell, but, <laughs> you know, that's how twisted they've made it because of man's imagination. Turn to Psalm 77, 11. Another thing you're supposed to be meditating on. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of thy doings. Thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary, who is so great as God, as our God. Thou art God that does, doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. Okay. Meditate on the work of the Lord, the things that God's done for you. The things you can give God glory in, give God thanks in. You can uh, meditate on some of the amazing things God has done. What's the number one thing that usually comes to mind? For me, Lord, what you did for me on the cross. How you saved me. You didn't have to do it, but you did it. How many of you guys meditate on the fact that God saved you? You didn't save yourself. Your belief didn't save you. You know, only believe, only believe, that junk over there. God saved you. Your repentance doesn't save you. Your belief doesn't save you. Confessing both in prayer doesn't save you. What saves you? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, save me. God saves you. How many of you guys meditate on that? How many times of you guys meditate on the gospel and the way the world is? And some of us get dis I understand some of us get down because we're meditating and we're thinking about the world and talking about the world with the Lord. And it's like they don't want to hear the gospel. But how many of you meditate, the Lord, if I can get that last soul saved? Lord, I just want to at least lead one person face to face to Christ. That's one of my deepest prayers, to be able to lead someone face to face to Jesus Christ. I mean, right now, I'm all for leaving tracks out. I'm all for doing videos for gospel messages, and someone comes across it, they could get saved, and you'd never know it. But I'd like to do it once face to face. How, how often do you guys meditate on that? No, we we, we got to do our junk. Our worldly junk, our fleshly junk, that's where our meditation goes. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm hoping this is encouraging to you. This is what your meditation is supposed to be on. Right? The works that God does, the things He gives you, the works of your hand, you give God glory for it because He allowed you to do it and gave you the strength to do it and gave you the knowledge to do it. Once again, we get so frustrated because these people that profess to be saved are not getting it. It's all about Jesus Christ. It's not about the flesh. Okay. What are people's response to, to, to what people? What are people's response going to be to this video, brothers and sisters? What are people's response going to be to you when you stand for what I'm saying and saying, "Okay, he's right. I've been compromising. Sorry, you guys. If you won't give up that video games, movies, TV shows, alcohol." cigarettes, weed, fornication, cussing, whatever it is. Some of those things I have a problem with, which I, that's one reason why I don't want it around me, but the other main reason is God says it's not supposed to be around me, period, whether I have a problem with it or not. I gotta kick that real quick. I have people out there saying, well, I don't really have a problem with video games at all, I don't play them or anything, but I think you're being a little too hard on those people who play. Whether you have a problem with that sin or not, sin is sin. Okay. When you make that stand and say, okay, I don't want this in my life, God's word says this, and you, as a brother with love, try to correct those people, here's what you're probably going to get most of the time. Turn to Jeremiah 13.10. This is what I've gotten. This is what other brothers have gotten that have tried to preach truth and love to people who profess to be saved, who profess that Jesus is number one in their life and not the world. This evil people which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their hearts. And that's what's going on. We got professing brethren in with among us that are walking in the imagination of their heart. And they won't hear God's word. We try to tell them God's word, try to tell them God's word, they won't hear it. And walk after other gods. 
that's how they're coming to light. They're realizing their God is not Jesus Christ. Their God is the God of this world, the flesh. To serve them and to worship them shall even be as their gir this girdle, which is good for nothing. What's going to happen? They're going to refuse to hear your words. Why? Because they're walking in the imagination of their heart. Going with the heart. Just go with the heart. Whatever the heart says. Go with your good feelings. You got that good feeling in you? Then go with it. Uh, no. Turn to Jeremiah 8.11. He says, Now therefore go to, speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye now every one from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. That's what we're doing. We're preaching the word of God to get people to do that. And people preach it to me, praise the Lord. I have had a lot of things cleaned out of my life because I've had people preach to me. Verse 12, And they said, There is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices, and we will everyone do the imagination of his evil heart. And that's the response that you're going to get, brothers and sisters of Christ. In these last days, reaching somebody is... You just celebrate. When I'm wrong and a brother's showing me something where I was wrong, he's all like, not rubbing it in, but he's saying, praise the Lord that I was able to reach somebody with truth. When I used to say falling into sin, you can't fall into sin. Okay? You choose to sin. I still had people attacking me on that, saying, no, no, I don't sin. It's the body that sins. I have no say in it whatsoever. Like, I have no control, no say. And it's like, there's people still defending that. But I got corrected on it. And it brothers like, praise the Lord that God was able to use me to show him the truth. But what are they going to do? They're going to be like, I ain't listening to you. I like my own devices. I can't do it, but I love my own devices. They walk after their own devices. They're following this. They're not following this. Be very careful when someone's trying to preach and teach, follow your own heart. Do you have a good feeling about it? Do you have a bad feeling about it? No, they should be saying, thus saith the Lord. Do they line up with this? Their words might line up with this, but what about their life? That's the biggest thing lately. I got deceived. Do the words line up with this? Yes. Do their, does their walk with the Lord line up with it? No. If it does, praise the Lord. If it doesn't, get away from them. Okay, don't be fellowshipping with somebody whose life does not line up with the Word of God. But we read there again their response. God's saying, repent. Do what's right. Please, me, not me, but he's saying, please me. <laughs> Talking about the Lord. He's saying, please the Lord. Do what's right. Repent. But they won't do it. They love their man's devices and their imagination of his evil heart. That's what they love. They love their flesh. They love their sin. That's why we always keep saying, you can tell people who justify sin because they love their sin. No conviction. They're always trying to justify it. They might go after a sin, hardcore, that they don't have a problem with, and it makes them look like they're a Christian, in words. But what about their actions, the life they're living, the sins they do struggle with? What is their response when you correct them on it? They love their sin. They justify their sin. They start. They try trusting Scripture. I've had them even just go flat, flat out against Scripture. You know. Sometimes I think when someone gets drunk, their true self comes out. The flesh takes over, and that's the one that was in charge all along. You know, and they'll say things. Um, getting high. You know, smoking cigarettes. Whatever. What is it? That's the response you get from when you try to correct them. And that's what this whole situation that happened recently among the body of Christ. People got called out on their sin. I've been called out on my sin. Okay, They've been called out on their sin. What's their, rea what's their reaction? I was called out on my sin. I just used that small one. I've been called out on a lot bigger ones about saying that you can fall into sin like it's not your fault. You had no choice. You're not held accountable. 
No, you are held accountable, you do have a choice, and it's your fault. And I got corrected on that. What's your attitude? He created scripture to me, he says, show me a scripture where it says you can fall into sin. It was nowhere to be found. I had to correct my speech. That brother was right. We sat there and show him, hey, here's all these verses against all these things that you're doing. What's their attitude? No, we love our sin. That's what you're going to get from people, especially in these last days, brethren. Don't let it get you down. My warning to you is what we read back there. Don't let it cleave to you. How do you not let it cleave to you? You have to break fellowship with people. You have to get lost people that you just can't be around them. I help neighbors out. I still talk to some lost family members and go have dinner with them every once in a while. But there's certain family members I can't be around because the sin that they're in is, is a specifically the sin that I have a problem with. But some are so bad, I'm not supposed to have that in my presence, period. Okay? They have no care. you got to get them out. No fellowshipping with somebody who's lost, definitely. What fellowship have uh, light with dark? We're not to fellowship with the lost world. But even with the brethren of Christ, that he falls back into sin, he starts justifying sin, he's not going to give up that sin, he won't take correction, you've done everything you could out of love, you got to go. you got to go. That's the, I'm trying to encourage you, brothers and sisters of Christ, you're going to have to do it. It's going to be tough, especially if it's a family member, someone you really love. All right. I've been there. Psalms 36.1 the transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. That's another thing I wanted to bring up. Brothers and sisters of Christ, as I'm looking at this stuff, there's no fear in their heart. When you try to tell them, hey, what you're doing there is a sin, the first thing that should hit them is, I'm sinning against God. God if you're truly saved, God could start chastising you at any moment to get you back on the right track. I'm sinning against God. What does the Bible say about what I'm doing? Okay, it's, it's, yep, the Bible said, stand from all wickedness. That thing I'm doing, it's wicked. It's got to get, where's the fear? Where's the fear? There's times people could hit you up and you go, okay, am I doing something wrong? If there's people that hit me up saying I'm doing something wrong and they've done it in such a way with good words and fair speeches, I actually thought I might have been wrong. And I talk with the brethren and I start going through scripture and we do a Bible study and they're like, no, nope, you were right in what you said. And I'm like, okay, thank you, Lord, for reassuring my heart. But my first thought was, am I doing something wrong against the Lord? Where's the fear of the Lord? Where's that fear? It's not there. And you'll see it in them. It's not there. Why? Because they're following the flesh. The imaginations of their heart. Their heart's desire is not to please God, and it's 100% about Jesus Christ. I want His Word in my heart so I can please Him and keep sin away. That's not their heart. Their heart is all about imagination and wickedness in the flesh. And with good words and fair speeches, boy, they can say the right things. But do their deeds line up with their work, with their words? And word and deed do all in the name of Jesus Christ. It says both need to line up. People take the deed part out and say, well, their words line up. That's all that matters, right? No. Their works need to line up. How they live their life needs to line up. Okay, if you want to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we're going to end here. We forgot to left the uh, bells hanging there. We've been given a, bless, a blessing. The Lord has blessed me. I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, we got water. Do it real quick. We got water. Praise the Lord, the tank, the sump, my uh, tank that's underground, the cistern, it's filled up. We've had nothing but fog. The ground has been wet as can be every morning. We've had fog, and the Lord has just been a blessing, and we've been not trying not to use any water whatsoever, and that cistern's filled up to halfway, and it's going up a little bit more. And praise the Lord. So those of you who've been praying for me, amen. But we have a cool breeze today. That's great. So closing, 2 Corinthians 10.1. Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent I am bold towards you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walk according to the flesh. i got to stop there. 
one of the things you're going to get, brothers and sisters in Christ, when you stand for absolute truth and you're calling out sin, one of the things you're going to get is you're going to get them turning around going, but you're a sinner too. You're, you're no better than I am. You've sinned here, 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 here. Look at all the mistakes you've made. They can't deal with their sin being pointed out. So what they do, they turn around and point out all your sin. And they make it out like, I walk in the flesh, you walk in the flesh. You know, now we're in the flesh, but after the flesh. I might be walking after the flesh, but so are you. So there's no big deal. Who are you to judge me? You're no better than me. And you get that attitude, and Paul's getting that, okay? He's written letters to the This is 2 Corinthians. He's written the letters to 1 Corinthians. He's written to the Corinthians saying, hey, what you're doing is wrong. And you get, I have no doubt that he's getting people going around going, but Paul's no better than you, than us. What's wrong with what we're doing? Paul's no better than us. Look at him. He's... He's walking in the flesh, and he's a sinner too, and he's doing all... They lied about him a lot too. But you're going to get that, brothers and sisters in Christ. Here's verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of the strongholds. People will take that and say, see, we don't war after the flesh. No, it's saying that the only way I can defeat the flesh is through this. There's nothing I can do to beat the flesh, to win. Okay? There's nothing I can do to save myself, if you want to go to the fullest extent. Five. Casting down, verse five, casting down imaginations. Notice it doesn't say wicked imaginations. It doesn't say vain imaginations. It just says imaginations, period. Here's the context. And everything that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Because people say, well, it's not really vain, and it's not really wicked. Does it exalt itself against the knowledge of God? A lot of things that the brethren lately have been standing against, the sin? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing, the next part, and bring it into captivity every thought, every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Jesus Christ comes back and gets us. When he comes back, is he going to find us obedient? Or is he going to find you disobedient? Is he going to find you falling into the flesh? Justifying the flesh? Falling into the trap of just saying, I love my sin and I just, I want my, if you're truly saved. When Jesus comes back to get you, what's he going to find you? In a state of obedience or is he going to find you in a state of disobedience? You're supposed to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. How do you know what the obedience of Christ is? You can't get away from it, brothers and sisters in Christ. Right here. God's perfect written word. You can't get away from it. All right. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, one of the reasons that we haven't really hit on, and I'll reiterate it again, is your thoughts and your imagination of the heart is bad. And your thoughts are supposed to be on Jesus Christ. One of the reasons we're against these video games, no matter how innocent they think they might seem, I have yet to see one video game that, they, that Satan hasn't snuck something in there, no matter how subtle, to start pulling you away from the Word of God and start enticing the flesh, using it to entice the flesh. Because the flesh wants to be in charge again. When you get saved, your flesh is no longer in charge. God is. Okay. But you're going to have people that just don't want to hear the truth. So no matter how much they try to say, well, there's innocent games, there's innocent satanic style music, what, 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 what about the heart? Imagination is vain. And that's what a lot of those things are. I have novels that I've been praying about, and I'm going to just burn them. I'm going to burn them and I'm going to throw them out. They're old kids' novels. They think they're innocent. I'm almost certain if I read through them, I'd find something wicked in them. And um, they're Alfred Hitchcock and the Three Investigators. I liked investigative novels, but they're vain imagination. They don't glorify God. They let you go into a fake world and go on a fake adventure that's not even real. They don't glorify God. When there's a lot of adventures out here you can have with the Lord that is real, and then getting lost in a book. This is the number one book I'd get lost in, and I do now. This is the number one book I read. I hardly read anything else at this point. Partly because I don't feel called like some brethren do. They feel called to read other books about Bibles, about dirt, certain things, and they can do videos on them. That's okay. But for me, this is the number one book I get lost in.
because it's real. I can apply it to my life. Okay? I'm supposed to hold this in my heart and it defends, helps me defend me and protect me from sin. I almost forgot. If you want to turn to Colossians 1, not Colossians, I'm sorry. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Verse 4. You say, well, what should we really be meditating on? I've already mentioned a lot of things that we're supposed to be meditating on. It's all about Jesus Christ. But this is a great one. A lot of brethren love this one. I love this one. So I just wanted to read it. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. He said it twice. If you can't rejoice in the Lord, you're not supposed to be doing it. And what you're doing, you're not supposed to do it. And what's sad is you get people that try to say, Well, I can rejoice in the Lord. They're gone. Drop them. Right. Rejoice in the Lord always again. And again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. How's the Lord going to find you when He comes back? In obedience or in disobedience? Following His word or getting following the ways of the world in your heart? Being conformed to the world? Being a friend of the world? Basically just being a friend to your flesh again, your best buds. Verse 6, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. That's where your hearts and minds are supposed to be on, Christ Jesus, His Word. Verse 8, finally brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good or of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Today it's this. Paul was there preaching the word verbally. Today we've been given the written word. But everything that's true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good, a good report. So is it a good report when you're putting a stumbling block in front of the brethren? No. Is it a good report if you're doing things that don't glorify God and you're justifying sin? No. Right. Or is it pure? No. Is it just? No. Is it Are you being honest? No. A lot of the brethren aren't. Right. If there be any praise, remember we just read up there, rejoice in the Lord always, again I say rejoice. Think on these things. Brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, I love my brothers and sisters in Christ out there. Okay, There's a lot of enemies in the ministry, God's ministry, that goes aboard for anybody who's getting on that's Bible-believing, God-fearing men that are getting on in the ministry. There's a lot of enemies out there. And like I said, Satan wants to do two things. He wants to prevent people from getting saved, so he's creating a lot of false converts. That's the number one way you keep someone from getting saved, is to create a false convert that they're solely based on their heart. It's about their flesh, what their feelings and opinions and everything. They don't have a final authority. And we've got a lot of people trying to creep in, trying to act like this is their final authority, when it isn't. Why? Because in words and deed, their deeds don't line up. And they're coming in and they're trying to get you, brothers and sisters of Christ, Satan's trying to prevent people from getting saved. And if you get saved, what does he do? He tries to come in and mess you up. Now we read about not cleaving to you. The works of the wicked, that do I hate. It will not cleave to me. How do you not have it cleave to you? You're out. I will not fellowship with you. Lost person, I'm sorry, but I will not be around you when you're doing those sins. Uh, and sometimes they're just so wicked, you just can't be around them, period. I have neighbors, they're lost. I go help them out. They've helped me out before. But when it comes to socializing and just, you know, party time, I don't spend time with them. They had a big party over here the other night. I could hear them playing uh, worldly music. They were getting drunk, get drinking and stuff. I won't have anything to do with that. Abstain from all appearance of evil. 
I don't want to cleave any of that junk cleaving, cleaving to me. It's tough, brothers and sisters in Christ. Satan's going to try to mess you up. He's going to keep trying to do it to get God to have to punish you, get you to lose rewards, and to see you fall. And he laughs about it. And his ministers laugh about it. I had someone in my life that she... They laughed when I had to step down from the ministry. They were happy and joyful when I stepped down from the ministry. Okay? That's their whole goal. That's what they want. They want to destroy God's ministry. They want to destroy your walk with the Lord. And this is how they do it. They get you to think, well, you can go off your feelings and opinions and the imaginations of your heart and just follow your heart. That's not how the Bible teaches. If you're following your heart, it's going to lead you astray and you're going to fall flat on your face time and time again. I can witness to it. And I know a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ out there can testify and they have witness, uh, testimonies of how they fell into the trap of following their heart and not the Word of God and they fell flat on their face. Listen to the brethren, not just me. Listen to the brethren when we give you warnings that, hey, the Bible says it's sin, get it out. If it doesn't glorify God, you can't give Him thanks. Get it out of your life. We're not doing this to be mean. We're not doing this because we're haters. We're doing this because we love you. We want to see your walk with the Lord to be as strong as ours. And vice versa, when we see someone that comes to correct me, and their walk with the Lord is really strong, I want my walk to be as strong as His. And if He's telling me, you got to get the sin out of your life for your walk to be... I'm going to get that sin out of my life. I want my walk with the Lord to be as strong as His. Okay? This is a plea, brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay. So, I'll end this with uh, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. This needs to be in your heart. Make sure this is in your heart, brothers and sisters in Christ. Keep standing. In these last days, keep standing. Thank you for watching.